Welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. First and foremost, uh, that was an amazing practice. Donnie and I, we co-host a podcast called Comeback Stories. Uh, we really try to uh, have real conversations. You know, Donnie and I both had a lot of things happen in our lives through our recovery journeys. And we found that just by being vulnerable every single day, wherever we go with whoever we're with, is how we've been able to you know, establish freedom in our lives and maintain it. Um, so this is the platform we try to carry that to and just to have, you know, conversations you may not hear normal people having, but it's a conversation that really allow you to form deeper bonds. So I'm excited to share this platform with Donnie and we've got an amazing guest and Zach here today. So let's get to it. Let's do it. I love you guys a lot. Love Special you, dudes up here. All right. So we are here with Zach Clark, founder of Release Recovery and Release Recovery Foundation. Also the winner of ABC's Bachelorette, where he was one of the most notable reality TV stars to share his message of sobriety on national television. So we're glad to have you here, man. I don't know what just happened in that prayer and meditation, but I'm feeling everything. So yeah. let's do this. Yes, thing. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. All right, we dive right in. We want to know what was it like for you growing up? So... You know, for me, I could sit here and tell you that things were hard, but they weren't. You know, like I have a very loving family. I'm one of I'm one of five kids and my parents are still very much in love today. And, you know, my existence growing up was I really like I, I measured who I was as a human being on how I was like doing on the sports field and what my old man kind of like thought I was doing on the sports field, you know? And, and so like that for me was a big piece of, of my growing up. And I never really vocalized that. Um, but if you looked at the Clark household from the outside looking in, like every, everything was cool. You know, we had the white picket fence and I grew up in South Jersey and, you know, I went to a really good public school and I never really wanted for anything, you know, like, I was probably the kid on the team, like with the new bat, you know, that everyone was using. And like, so I think that's a good way to kind of, to kind of put it right. To bring you into that, to that upbringing that I have. But all that said, doesn't mean that I didn't have my, my shit, my stuff going on. So. I'm always fascinated by that because that's obviously Darren and I came up with these questions and first couple of podcasts, the first one was Darren telling his story and the second one was mine. And, Growing up for Darren was confusing. And if you've heard that story, mine was also easy, right? Confusing, easy, easy, but yet we somehow all landed in a, in a, in a dark place at some point in our lives. I, mean, I, I will say this, like when I, when I showed up in New York City 10 years ago, like I, I, and I'll get into this, like I got sober and I showed up in New York City, there was an element of culture shock, right? Because I grew up in this white Anglo-Saxon Protestant town where like the parents would go to the country club you know, on Friday night and the kids would go drink on the eighth hole of the country club, you know, like, or, or, or one of the houses where the parents were at. And there was, there was no diversity. There was no culture. There was no introduction to like everything else that was going on in the world. And I don't, I don't blame my family. I don't blame my upbringing. I don't blame anyone for that other than that's just like the hand I was dealt. Uh, but I get it. And I understand why people end up being the way they are in this world, because sometimes it's just that lack of education or knowledge, right? Like this whole idea that knowledge is power. So that was definitely adjustment as I like pushed through in, in my life. Can you talk about, a, did you have an early memory of pain? Pain, huh? I don't. I mean, I can tell you this, like, I know growing up that I was a very emotional kid and I still am very emotional today. Like I feel stuff on a level that like can be really uncomfortable. And I don't know if I can point to pain, but I remember, I don't know if anyone relates with this, but like, I love my parents so much. And I was always so scared of death growing up. Like that was a thing that just like crippled me for whatever reason, like what happens after we leave this planet. And I remember like when my mom would tuck me in at like 12, 13, 14 years old, like I would have these crazy thoughts of, all right, I want to live to be 30 and then I want to die because I don't want to see my parents die. I don't want to see anyone around me die. I don't want to know what happened. Like it was this whole crazy. So like it wasn't pain, but it was like these really intense thoughts of, 
of like a little kid I don't think should be having. The other pain that I felt is, you know, I would say like as it relates to being an athlete on the field, I, and it ended up like propelling me forward, but growing up, like I hit puberty late, right? So like I was always the smallest kid. Same. <laughs> Same. 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 You know? <laughs> We're at the concert last night. This dude is like, I'm like standing behind him. I'm like, <laughs> um, I have you. And so like I was, I always felt like I had to figure stuff out. And, and like on the athletics field, like there was always this element of this chip on my shoulder. of Like I knew everyone was a little bit better than me, but I'm going to figure out a way. And that would carry into my drug use down, down the line. Because I always figured it out. I always got what I needed. Who was your first real teacher growing up? So, I, I look at my childhood and, you know, there's no, like my parents have always and still to this day continue to be my greatest teacher just because I feel like, like I was never grounded. I was never in trouble, but they taught me the difference between right and wrong. You know, and from a very early age, my dad taught me like, you know, don't go out to eat at a restaurant if you can't afford the 20% tip to take care of the person waiting on you. You know, like these little things that he started to like drop into my life. And I saw him, you know, like there was a period of time, like right before I started really remembering stuff that, that the family was kind of like my dad go, did go into bankruptcy and there was like some things going on that I knew behind the scenes my parents were kind of masking that said, like I, like I said, like I never wanted for anything. But he taught me about like grit and perseverance and pushing forward. And so I, I really, I revered my father. And then my mother was just, and still is the best. I mean, I, I like, my mom picked up golf recently in like the last three, four years. And I love golf and I've been golfing with her. And it's being out there on a golf course with my mother has been one of the greatest gifts I've, I've been given, you know, because I just learned so much from her. And even to this day, she's a teacher, like, as a woman who's, you know, 60, whatever years old, having the, you know, courage to pick up a golf club, a golf club and start playing is, it was amazing to me. She doesn't even know that, right? Uh, and then I look at, I look at some of like, you know, my coaches, my coaches growing up and my high school football coach was, you know, a high school football coach, you know, <laughs> he, he was in your face. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> right? I know exactly what you mean. I mean, he was in your face, but every practice would kind of like end with a prayer. And he really just wanted to teach us to be men. I didn't understand that at the time. I thought he just wanted to win games. But he had been around long enough and to know that like win or lose, his, his role was to make me a better person and uh to this day i mean i love i love being taught like i mean that's why i reached out to you i needed i got to a place in my life where i needed i wanted to level up again you know so having that open-mindedness but yeah i love coaches i love mentors um i'd love for you to take us through um from like the beginning of your using journey and what that looked like for because for anybody that doesn't really know my story uh, i started using on like 15 and it felt like my life got better when i was using and then like if you if you look at it from like you zoom out it's like i went to a great college and then i went to the nfl and it's just like all these things look great but really it was like my inner world and like my character and my integrity were just like going down like inverse of where like my professional career and all these things that people celebrated was going great so like could you like parallel like what your life was looking like but while also like what you're using was maybe doing to you at the same time yeah yeah i'll dumb it down i mean i typically take a long time to tell the story but i'll, I'll uh, and i i just want to say like i just want to vocalize just sitting up here with you and being here with you guys i just every time i'm around specifically men that are doing the deal and like staying sober on a day like Sober people are the best, you know, and like we went to this concert last night, right? And we, and a couple of our friends that we met showed up, which is just amazing in itself. But 
you know, we at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, we're able to like spark these like awesome conversations with people that we just met. And like that to me is what has been one of the biggest gifts, like just this connection and like being here with you, Donnie and, and Darren, like it's, it's crazy, but no, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, like I started, I, I remember my first drink vividly because it was, it was at a Christmas party and you know, kind of like, kind of like the story goes, like the older guys handed me this beer and I drank it and I went back to the Christmas party where all the parents were hanging out. My mom and dad were like, where were you at? And like, I lied about where I was at. What were you doing? I lied, you know? And that was the moment at like 14, 15 years old, whatever it was, that I learned how to lie. And what was validated by me from the world is that the next morning I woke up and Christmas happened and I opened gifts and no one figured anything out. And I was like, it's like this light bulb went off. It was like, oh, I can tell people whatever I want and they're just going to believe me. So as much as my, and we got into this a little bit last night about like the what for me doesn't matter. I mean, it started with a drink and it ended up with a needle in my arm and what happened in between was crazy, but I always like to say it's not so much about the substance, it's about what was going on with me. And so, you know, I took that first drink and I, I fell in love with that party life, you know, and I fell in love with the way that alcohol made me feel and the way that alcohol allowed me to kind of leave this crazy mind and this like hole in the soul that I had come too familiar with even at, a, at like a young age. And so, you know, what it looked like was like high school, right? I was, I was, my superlative in the yearbook was life of the party. And I wore that shit like a badge, you know what I mean? Like, I was the guy like hauling the kegs out to the woods and like, you know, making everyone do shirt off shotguns and belting out classic rock songs and lighting the biggest bonfire. It was like that dazed and confused existence. And I was like, this is life. This is why we're on this planet. I am like, I figured it out. And, uh, you know, then I showed up at college and I went, I I had a choice, like going into college, it was like, you can go and you can play baseball at a lower level, like a smaller division three school, which is what I ended up doing. Or I could go to a university of Maryland, university of Delaware and something is like, I I knew something. If I went to one of those big schools, like it was game over. Like I wasn't going to make it to school if I did that. So I go to this small little school out in New York, Pennsylvania, which like, is this obscure place. I was just back there for the first time a couple weeks ago in like 10 years. It's still mind bending. Um, but I started drinking and, and then I started doing the drugs at that point, right? Like I found the Coke, I found the Adderall, I found these things that allowed me to drink longer and stronger than just drinking. But the thing that's important for me to say is like I kept my appearance up. I showed up in practice. I worked hard. I was like the vocal leader of the team. Like I dressed that shit up the way that I thought I had to and it, and it kept working. And uh, I'll just never forget like my senior year, I was probably blacking out like two, three times a week. And I didn't even know what a blackout was. Like I thought when people drank, you just drank and you forgot stuff because that's what happened when you, when you drank. And then like one of my friends, like, you know, that's not normal to like stop. <laughs> remembering stuff after 11 o'clock I was like really dude that doesn't happen to you and I was like it was like this moment of like there's something wrong with me and uh you know I'll speed it up but like I never had consequences and it wasn't until I, I met this girl my sophomore year and I ended up marrying her you know after we got out of college and what happened for me was I left college. I thought I was going to play baseball. That didn't work out. I thought I was going to like be involved in sports. That didn't work out. This like central part of my relationship with my father was taken away from me, right? Because like our whole relationship was based around baseball, which was sweet, but at the same time, it was like really sad because there's nothing else that we ever talked about. And uh, I. I had a, it was Memorial Day weekend and I was packing my car to go to the shore with a bunch of friends. Like this is like the summer after college and I had not been feeling good. And this just like tells you a little bit about like where I was with my 
was m- with my use, like I kept telling my family that I didn't feel well, and they kept telling me, Zach, you're just hungover, right? So it started to become a part of my identity. Like I would come down in the morning, I hadn't drank, and I was like, I really don't feel well. So I took it upon myself to go get it, to go get an x-ray, and the, I like went to this side of the road x-ray place on the way to the Jersey Shore, Memorial Day weekend, and this woman came back like with my scan and was like, Yo, you're sitting right there. Like you have something growing on your brain. You gotta like, you gotta go and you gotta go now. And I'll never forget, like, what do you mean? And within 12 hours, I'm in surgery getting this tumor cut out the back of my head. And I share that experience, and I've never been healthier in my life. Like it ended up not being cancerous. I mean, it was scary. I was in the hospital for, you know, like 20 something days or whatever, like occupational therapy, learning to walk, talk, do all that stuff again. But the feeling is what's most important. And the feeling I had while I was in that hospital, and which is like something that I've really come to understand in, in my recovery is that, and when people come to me for help, because that happens a lot of times, I'm sure Darren, for you, like people come to you for help. And I had so much love in that hospital room, University of Penn House, I'll never forget it. People bringing me cheesesteaks and soft pretzels, putting the Phillies on, like it was amazing. And I couldn't stop thinking about what I was gonna do when I got out of that hospital bed. Mm-hmm which was I was going to go drink and drug with permission because now I'm some kind of like hero for getting through this thing. So my whole life was this negotiation of like, if I do this, I get to party this way. And, you know, I know I don't have, I don't have all day to tell the story, but basically what ended up happening is I get out of the hospital, I recover, I get on one knee, I propose to my, you know, girlfriend at the time, we had this big party down the Jersey shore. I remember like turning the corner to like get married and like had this moment of like, what am I about to do? You know? But at that point in my life, it was like, it would be the what the, and then like, let's keep moving forward. So I go, I go on this honeymoon. I like detox on the honeymoon. It's just, it's so insane. We went to like, you, the Virgin Islands were like, I, I don't even know. But anyway land back in philly and the first text message i sent is my drug dealer you know after like spending a full week detoxing like and that's what i always said there's no there was no amount of love or human power that was going to get me sober like i had to go through what i had to go through and i ended up in in rehab the first time and to this like to your point like the parallel like i i never once really thought about getting sober because in my life nothing was going wrong yet and the first consequence came after the first time i went to rehab my what my wife at the time now ex-wife and one of my angels on this planet i got high five days after i got out of rehab she's like yo you're out of here this party is over and she meant it and she held that boundary and she walked out the door and that was the end of that relationship like she and she saved my life because then for the next eight months, what happened was between that rehab and the second rehab, it got really gnarly. And I'm not going to go into the stories, but it ended like during that eight months, I had my gallbladder cut out, chasing painkillers. Like my gallbladder was completely fine. Like I went under just to get that thing taken out so that I could get three or four more days of the pain pills. The doctor was from my hometown. So I, he's like, you sure you're like, you sure you want to go through this? I was like, absolutely. You know, and I was able to go back to that doctor, like in my recovery and sit him down and be like, dude, I was totally full of shit. Like, I apologize for, for, you know, like that's the stuff we get to do. But it ended up like alone in Camden, New Jersey, sleeping on a cardboard box, not because I had to, like my family loved, like they would have taken my calls, but because I thought that's what I deserved, you know, with a needle in my arm and a crack pipe in my mouth. And that's just where it went for me. And, uh, at that point, the consequences started coming and coming quick. And there's a whole story around how my dad came in the bank and, you know, the bank teller called him. He rushed down to the bank, kind of grabbed my arm and off to rehab I went. And that was August, you know, of 2011. <clears throat> Here I am today with whatever, 10 plus years sober. So that was one of the, like that August of 2011 was the darkest time. And the parallel of what was going on in my life from like, this kid who like had it all, right? To literally alone, hanging out with drug dealers, like trying to turn my next trick was just, that's what happened. Right, and I feel like, 
that's why it's important to talk about like addiction and alcoholism as a disease, right? Because a lot of people, I feel like, it's an old school thing to be like, man, he would stop if he wanted to, or like, you got the willpower, you got the strength. But it's really like you hear this and you hear so many examples of why somebody should stop. And you're like, why wouldn't they? But it's this craving that develops and it's like a disease of the mind and the body. It's like somebody can have so many good things going, so many good opportunities, so many good relationships, but still just tear it down. And then eventually it's like, you know, you talked about from when you started about lying and then, you know, all the things that you did from getting your gallbladder removed. It's like there's this stench that grows inside of you. At least I know for me where it's just like you don't really fuck with you. Like you just like you lose that self-respect and it just drives you deeper and deeper. And the consequences just don't hit anymore. Like I got arrested three times. I've been suspended or kicked off of every level of athletics I've ever played on. Um, you know, overdosed in my car off of pills. And it's just like all these things kept happening, kept happening, kept happening. And it's just like, it was never enough, but it's this disease that's in me that's developing and festering. It's, you know, unless you really, you know, put the world on pause and are able to go to a rehab and take multiple times. Cause I went to outpatient programs and things and I was just like, I'm not having this, but eventually you get brought to your knees at some point. I can relate so much to the uh, gall gallbladder surgery because to many people that don't understand would be like, who the hell does that? I did it. I had a, I had a surgery on my knee. <laughs> we did. I, I, I had a surgery. The doctor asked, he, he, I had some issues going on with my knee and he's like, I can squeeze you in tomorrow. I'm like, done. Because that means I'm guaranteed going to have pills tomorrow. That's the insanity. That's the power of the disease um, and the grip that it can have on you. So to share that is so important. And for these guys to share it on the platform that they have, I mean, Darren and I started this podcast um, on a mission to reach as many people as possible to, to remind them that they're not alone. So when you might hear something in Zach's story or, or my story or Darren's story, it kind of bankrupts that, the story that we're telling ourselves of I'm alone, nobody understands. At my rock bottom, that's what I was saying. My understanding of mental health and suicide and people who are about to make that, that decision, that's the story they're telling themselves. I'm alone. So as we start this, and, and for you guys to share it on the stage that you have, um, it's such a beautiful gift to be so real and raw. And um, I always say you're only as sick as your secrets. So it's kind of mm. cool to be able to, uh, for you guys to be able to, to do it on such a large stage. But what do you think for you? What was real quick on that? Like, that's where the freedom comes from. Right. And like being honest, right? Because like, and it's funny, I keep going back to this experience. We had this concert last night. Like we, we went to this concert and then we were hanging out with these these people afterwards, and I turned to this one kid and I said, do you party? He's like, naturally, yes. I was like, that's cool, man. And like, there really is no judgment in that question. Right. What I loved about this kid, Justin, that I met is that he was fucking honest, you know? And like that, that is what I've taken from all of this is like so many people lie because they think the world wants them to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for, um, again, I come back to both of you for the stage that you have and to watch how you have given other people permission to do the same, to be in a safe space, you know, and watching Darren and other NFL guys follow him and talk openly about their sobriety, like this dude over here, uh, I feel like I'm his hype person because he's humbled, humbled to a fault Appreciate sometimes. You, <laughs> but um, <clears throat> he's done, done amazing things and given guys permission and now they're, they're doing they're doing the same. It's kind of like the lone wolf, the one that has the courage to step out. Um, and then who will follow? Well, a lot of players have. And again, I think you're, you're changing the language and um, changing this whole perception and breaking the stigma of addiction and what it really means. Yeah. So what's, what was the story that you had to stop telling yourself in order to tell your comeback story? You mean once I was like sober and comfortable with it? Yeah, or? like what well, I always say with the only story that matters is the one that we tell ourselves. So what was it? Like what was the the shift for you? I think for me, like early and I even think back to when I was in rehab, like I went to rehab for four and a half months and I started to see that people loved me just for who I was then. Because it was, it was this whole idea of like, I started to tell the truth. Um, and people just like, oh, that's cool. 
you know, like I started to get this affirmation from the world and like no one was like there was the only judgment taking place was the, my judgment of myself. And that's what I had to kind of like work past. And then I fully recognize and I acknowledge the fact that like I've even before any like look, look like I acknowledge that people, most people out there know me because I was on this reality television show. Right. And that's cool. And, and, and I'm fine to lean into that. I also acknowledge and know and have to know that like I am I am much more than that. And so I was actively telling my story and leaning into my truth well before, you know, any any appearance on television. And that's something that I had to get comfortable with really early on because in recovery what I've learned is that I don't get to keep any of this unless I'm sharing it, giving away to all the people around me. So living this right? I mean, that's what we learn. And it's this life of service and all that shit sounded so cheesy when I was first getting sober. It's like prayer, meditation, service. I was like, take, take all this bullshit. <laughs> and, and like, you know, but I started to do it and I started to open up and I started to see people come back like, hey man, thanks for doing that. Thanks for sharing that. Good to meet you. And I was like, I started filling up my teacup with, with, with the good stuff. And so... I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think like for me, like the shift for me occurred when I really learned and understood that if I'm not, if I am not, okay, there's two things. I understand that I have to be sober. Like I understand that for myself. I'm not going to judge anyone else, but for me, drinking and drugging doesn't work. Like that's a fact that I have to swallow and like that's just the way it's going to be. And then two, in order to keep my sobriety, and, and this is where the whole like shift comes in, I understand that I need to be willing and ready to share my experience with someone else who is struggling at any time. And by doing that, I got very comfortable in my own skin. I think that's deep because like that willingness that you talk about, it comes with like a sense of discomfort. like. Everything about getting sober and changing my life was uncomfortable, but it's valuable because every experience that's uncomfortable, any kind of fear, like there's no way around it. There's no way to just like, and there's no running in the opposite direction from it because it's going to stay there. But if you walk through the things that are uncomfortable or that scare you or the things that you think you'd never share with anybody, once you share those things, going through that is what gives you that liberation, that feeling of like, okay, like that weight is off my shoulders. But if we don't seek this route of discomfort of everything's within our comfort zone and things that we like to do and things that we know how to do, um, we're going to be stuck in the same place. That's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same shit and thinking that things are going to change. So, (laughs) How has life been for you post-reality show, post-Bachelorette, stepping? I'm kind of fascinated by the idea of maybe being a not a known public figure obviously you're doing amazing things in the community in the recovery world but like stepping back into that and and being recognized to me that feels very daunting so how was it initially and what do you do today to uh to not give your power away and have boundaries and not take in some of that energy that's probably trying to penetrate your your whole energy field I remember one of my going back to mentors telling me very early on, and I, I keep like, you're going to get from me like the things I believe in is community, like humans doing stuff shoulder to shoulder, whether you're in recovery or not. Like this room is not all people that are sober. Uh, these are all people that chose to be here today for whatever reason. Maybe it was to do yoga. Maybe it was to get a picture with Darren. Like, I don't know why the hell they're here, but like they decided to show up. <laughs> But, um, you know, so community and truth. And so for me, like one of my mentors early on grabbed me and like looked me dead in the eye, you know, like looked me like, Zach, there is one story and that's the truth. One story. You have lived your life. Your life has happened. That is the fact. There's no like 110%. There's no 90, like. There's a hundred percent your story, your truth. 
And so for me, I, I think, I don't think, I actually know, like going into that experience, stepping into that environment, a lot of people are like, well, how do you drink? And was everyone drunk? And how do you do this? I'm like, that's just, this, this, there's not even a thought about that because this is how I live my life. And so coming out of that, like what I have had to do is continue to try and just be my most authentic self. And so like where I've run into, where I've gotten resentment, I will say, is like the person that comes up and this happens and they just want the photo because I'm a piece in their text message chain or their story or like whatever the hell it is. Right? Like I'm just like, I'm a piece of, I'll say like meat. They ask for the photo and then they run away. I want to humanize that shit. I want to say, what's your name? What's going on? You know, and I've had to really understand that like that people, some people just don't want that. And the people that do want to connect and do want to talk about it, you know, they'll stick around and they probably won't even ask, ask for the picture because that's not what they're there for. Right. And so I think there's a certain level of trust that I've had to develop. I think I've had to tighten my circle a lot. Like I've brought a lot of people in and I've connected with more people, but like my real circle, like there's a dude Joe here today who's like in my real circle who knows what time it is with me all day, every day. And I have to have a few of those people because I trust, I trust him, you know? And that's also been hard is that like, I've actually seen some people act a certain kind of way that I didn't think that that's who they were and that's not my shit you know and if i want to give my power away to that then i'm going to be in a jackpot but that's why i mean like like i always say right like michael jordan had phil jackson every great athlete has a coach at some point and that's why like at 10 years sober like i reached out to you and i was like yo over like and then how did i get to you like, how did I get to, like, fucking social media, which can be the devil, but there's also, like, I choose to see the good in them. And I lean into that. Like, people, like, when you ask them how they met, well, like, we met on Hinge, you know? And they're like, like <laughs> I'm like, yo, I reached out to Donnie on social media. What's up? Yeah. You know? And, like, it's all energetic, you know? I slid into Darren's DMs. <laughs> hey. that's, how, that's, how, that's, that's how we met. It's powerful. I sat there, I was watching Hard Knocks, and when... Basically, Darren came out and shared his story of recovery. I instantly jumped on Instagram and reached out to him and said, hey, I work with athletes. I was working with the Phoenix Suns back home. And I'm like, if you ever need anybody, I got you. Like, he reached out. So it's a beautiful thing. It's power shoot, of connection. Shoot or shoot. Yeah. What are you most grateful for today? I mean, that's my sobriety. Man. I mean, that's just it. Like, that's everything stems from that. And I remember explaining that to my mother because she took offense to it. You know, she's like, what do you mean? I was like, I was taught that it needs to be the most important thing in my life above anything else, my sobriety. And, you know, after that, it's family. Like, I am so grateful. I work in behavioral health care. I see broken family systems. I see absent fathers, absent mothers. I see the adoption. I see the ways that these things affect people. And that, that's not my story. So I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so my family, my recovery is like right here, variety. Then it's my family. And then, you know, as you were saying the Lord's Prayer today, you know, that, 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 that prayer that is just so beautiful. It's just, I, I started to get emotional there because it's like this community. And, and humans, like there is a lot good in the world if we look for it. And I say that because that's something I'm grateful for is this ability to not, like negative people drive me nuts, bro. They just drive me <clears throat> nuts because it's just like, it sucks the energy out of you. And like, I do a pretty good job of not talking shit, but like if I'm around someone that's negative, like I'll take that, I'll take the bait and next thing I know, I'll be like calling someone a scumbag. I'm like, that's not me, yeah. you know? It's crazy you say that. There was a, uh, there's a meeting I go see every Thursday I was telling you about. And one of the guys came in and he's like, um, 
be a thermostat, not a thermometer. And I was like, huh? And I thought about it for a second. It's like the thermostat dictates the weather, whereas the thermostat just reads the weather, it like adapts to the weather. So it's like if you, you bring that mindset with you everywhere you go, that positive energy with you everywhere you go, instead of like reacting to what's going on in any environment you're in. And I was just kind of like, boom, crazy. But do you have like today, is there like certain like mantras or prayers or like how do you keep yourself grounded in that on a day to day? So my big thing, like, you know, if you know me, like it's just keep going. I, and so many, like, I, I say it without even knowing that I'm saying it, you right. know, and I've, it's just been something I've always said. Since I get so, and like, so that was a mantra early on. Just like, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's kind of like that bite down your mouth, mouthpiece mentality. You know, it's like, I know I'm going to get knocked on my ass. I know that this is not going to be perfect. But if I have the ability and I have this blind faith, and I have this belief to keep going and I do that, most of the time things work out. Like it's never as good as it seems and it's never as bad as it seems. And that's why I need to kind of keep, keep pushing forward. So I do, I try to keep it simple with the keep going. You know, my friend over here has me back into my, you know, meditation routine, which I'm grateful for. And, you know, I, I, (laughs) there's just this realness that comes. Like I see this dude and he's like got the necklaces and the beads and I'm like, this dude must levitate, right? Like, <laughs> you know? And the reality is, is like I went on one of his retreats and I've gotten to know Donnie over the past couple of months. It's like, he's like, dude, there's totally like three or four days in a row where I won't meditate or like, I'll, I'll like, it'll be one minute and out the door. And like, that's, that's okay. Because I think my mind works like I must do 20 minutes. I must do this. And like, you know, I always tell people I run marathons, right? And so, like, and I don't do them for time. I do it for the community, and I do it for the philanthropic nature of it, like, to raise money and bring people together. But whenever people tell me, like, I can't run a marathon, I'm like, yes, you can. You absolutely can. It's way more, people make it way more dramatic than you think. And back to the mantras, like, if you commit and you just keep going during that, you know, couple months leading up to it, there'll be days that you don't run. And you'll feel bad about it. Just like there's days when I don't meditate or whatever it might be that I'll feel bad about it. But I have another, like every day is an opportunity to improve on the day before, you know, and like brick by brick, I've built this foundation for myself where I know that this whole like keep going mentality and mantra, that works for me. And that might be too intense for other people, but that's just what, that's what works for me. And so, um, and it's not always easy, man. Like there's some days when I wake up and I don't want to get out of bed or I look at the calendar and I'm like, God, I really have to meet with this person, you know? And then like you take the meeting and it's like the great, it's like my old, old man taught me in business. Like you take every meeting, you never know what's going to come out of it. And that's been my experience. What would you say to somebody maybe in this room or somebody that's listening, that's struggling and they, they're stuck, they know they're stuck, but they just don't know what to do about it? What would you tell them? This question I get asked so much, man, and, and Darren, I'm sure you have some thoughts on it. I know people, you know, reach out to you. And, and so I'm sitting here listening to Darren and I'm thinking like him talking about overdosing and starting using pills at 15 and being suspended and kicked out. And like, we've been kicking it the last day. And I'm like, this is like the sweetest, kindest human I've ever met. And, you know, like, as much as Darren might want to take credit for that, like, that's not him. Like, there's something else out here looking out after us. And I had to believe that in order to heal, get better. And, you know, look, like, I grew up Presbyterian. Like, we, I was a cheester. I went to church on Christmas and Easter. You know, like, that's just the way it was. And so this is not, like, a religious thing for me. This is a spiritual thing. And, and so, like, when someone is struggling, I think it's always important to lead with love. Telling them they should do this or should do that usually doesn't work. They'll probably combat that. Typically, if I'm working with a family that really wants to intervene, it's amazing how many families out there don't have the ability to get the 
the family together because the system's so broken, sit the person down that they're worried about and just have an honest, real, loving conversation with them. You know, because they think that the person's going to run or they're going to do this. And they're like, when you lead with love, most of the time, like the person on the other end of the table is at least going to hear you out. They might not listen, but they're going to like, it's going to get inside them somehow. Um, but then like if a young guy comes to me, he's like, I, you know, like, because I'm sure you get this and I get this a lot. It's like, it's not about what I'm saying. It's about people watching the way that I live my life. It, it, it's nothing that I'm saying. And so when a young guy comes to me or a young girl comes to me and they say, like, I'm curious about my relationship with drugs and alcohol, I challenge them. I say, like, try to not drink for a week. Try to not drink for two weeks. See where that leads you. See what you feel with that. See if you can even do it. Because if you can't, then you might want to look a little deeper at your relationship with drugs and alcohol. So that's like the, the, the early stage person that's like kind of like in this exploratory phase. You know, get into therapy, start being honest with people around you. When the, when the jackpot's already hit, you know, and, I, and someone's like, you know, physically addicted to opiates or benzos or, you know, blowing an eight ball of coke a day. It's like, all right, this party's over. We got to like intervene. <laughs> It's a wrap. You're going away. You know, like so. There's kind of like two levels of this thing, um, but just letting people know. And I've had people reach out to me 18 months after saying, like, just you know, they remember it. It's not always going to happen on my watch. Yeah. Talking about being there for people. What? What was the, we talked about the shift from you know, like you basically being on that cardboard box to getting sober. What was the shift of? getting sober and building a new life, constructing a new foundation for your life, and then wanting to move into work like release? Amazing question. I, uh, <laughs> it's just so crazy that I'm sitting here. I walked here today. Like I live right in this neighborhood. This is home. And you're at like, so I, I remember I was, I was in rehab for four and a half months. I was a sick one. They wouldn't let me leave. And I remember at the end, I was really pushing hard to go back to like South Jersey, Philly, like do something down there. And my counselor kind of like said to me, what about New York? And what I knew about New York at that point in time is that their sports team sucked, that it smelled bad, that it was expensive and like that it was overcrowded because that's what my dad had instilled in my mind. But for some reason, like talk about this higher force, like I said, let's look at it. So I moved to New York City, and when I tell you I knew zero people, I knew zero people. I knew nobody. I knew that I had to be sober, and I knew that there was something really interesting around the people that I had met in, in treatment, that like those were kind of my people. And so the real shift for me happened when I showed up here in New York, and I started throwing myself into that community and meeting other people who had this shared journey you know, and had come out on the other side. And I started to realize, like, you know, I can still play golf. I can still go to concerts. I can still, you know, go to games. I can do all the things that I want to do and do it sober. And so once I had that, like, in my pocket, I also knew that I loved helping people, you know. And so I went and I found a job in behavioral health care for the first five years here in New York. And then five years ago, like I doubled down and I bet on myself and I said, let's, <laughs> let's do this thing. And, you know, we started release recovery, which is like, a, a, what I describe as like a full service addiction recovery and, and, and mental health organization, right? We, we provide transitional living here in the city, up in Westchester. And then we also do a lot of that, that work, that intervention work, that sober coaching, that companionship, like, this dude, Mario, in the back in the jacket, like he's taking, fresh. <laughs> he's taking more dudes to men and women to treatment than, than anyone I've ever met. I mean, this guy's a road dog. And, and that's like, he's one of those people I talk about, right? Like these special people that you meet and they're on the same wavelength than you because like they might like nice things and they might like having fun. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to us is to help others. And so we've been able to, you know, create a pretty, a pretty cool business. And I look around this room and there's people that like 
I'm not going to out you. Don't worry. But like I've come through our program and are like still showing up. And like, that's the stuff, dude, that I'm not like equipped to even like think about because I get, I get too choked up. And so like, um, it's been an awesome five years. And then we started the nonprofit, which basically we're raising money. And like, I do again, like I acknowledge the, the whole thing with like being on tell, like has really helped with that. Right. Like that's been one of the, because we raised like a million bucks last year and we sent, we spent, we sent like, you know, 40 some people to treatment, you know, we started their recovery journey and, uh, you know, it's like that whole idea of like the greatest gift is in the giving. And, and I was telling you last night there, and it doesn't mean that like, I don't get fried out being around alcoholics and sick people all the time. It's like too much sometimes, but that's just the way it is. Who would you say is the one person that gets your comeback story shout out? We know we can't do this alone. Who's the one for you? What do you mean? Who's that one person that's always been in your corner, always had your back no matter what? Who comes up? Uh, I mean, it's family for me, man. Like, you know, I just think, um, dude, that one rocked me. Holy shit. So my parents, you know, for sure. And then, uh, you know, like my brother, Matt, he he's five years older than me and he like he hung in there and i'll never forget like my uh my niece taylor never seen me load like the only niece or nephew that well like i have an older niece that's you know that was around when i was getting fucked up but like so my my nephew jack i remember i'll never forget like being in like my 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 uh Sister in law is giving birth to Jack, and I'm down the hall, like ripping Oxycontin, you know, in the bathroom. And, uh, you know, but then, like, all of my nieces and nephews after that, none of them see me high, you know, or drunk, which is like such a gift. The reason I say that is because, like, my brother knows that, you know, like, he knows that I, you know, drove his, like, pregnant wife around high. Like he knows that, like, you know, he, he knows that. And this whole idea, and like we talk about it a lot, Donnie, is like a forgiveness, you know, and there's like, like one of the things I'm working on right now is like being able to forgive in a way that doesn't mean I have to like take, like bring that person back in my letter, like whatever, but just like forgive, right? And, and be okay. But yeah, my parents, my mom and dad are special humans. Uh, my dad just turned 80. We like took him out to the Indy 500. And it was just like this unbelievable weekend. And the guy is just like the junkyard dog. You know, the guy's not stopping for his light and chicken wings for 80 years. Like that's, that's the diet. And then my mom's just like, you know, she's got the biggest heart. And she's so selfless. And I just wish that like sometimes she would, uh, she would take some of what she gives away for herself. So I can't do it all down to one. It's those three people. Thanks, man. Well, it's been an honor, a privilege, and a blessing to uh, hear your story and, and for you to ultimately create this space for us so Darren, can, Darren and I can just come in and, and do our thing. So just want to acknowledge you for the human that you are and how you're showing up in the world. And uh, I feel like we haven't known each other long, but... Uh, Besties for life, for sure. Um, you're, you're much more than the winner of the Bachelorette, bro. Like, <laughs> seriously, you're a good man, dog. It's, it's been an honor to meet you and hang around with you this weekend. I appreciate you guys. And I just got to, like, I, I got to say it back to you guys. Like, I really, I feel very comfortable up here. I feel very proud, you know, being amongst you two. Because, you know, and I'll say it this way. Like, you know, we had the balls to, like, step out and be, like, okay not being okay and like talking about whatever it is that's going on and that's not some like debbie down or depressing shit like make no mistake about it i would say like we're, we're living pretty good right now i got no complaints <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks guys Thank appreciate you, you guys